wall-mounted galvanic lanterns flicker as the sirens wail, the plaintive cries of the alarms echoing down steel-lined corridors. Left here, Tatters cries, wrestling with the map and trying to keep up with the others. Then left up the stairwell at the end and... Oof! She runs straight into the unyielding slab of Alphonse's back, who has skidded to a halt at Valerian's raised hand. With fingers to his lips, Valerian gestures them swiftly back, pressing his own back to the wall. And not a moment too soon. A squad of green, uniformed, grim-faced guards come running down the cross corridor, heavy battens clutched in meaty hands. Valerian waits until the sound of their heavy boots fade, and then gestures them on. That was too close. Which way from here, Tatters? Give me a second. Scale rolls his eyes. This is some rescue. When you came in here, didn't you have a plan for getting back out? Maybe you'd like it better back in your cell, Scale, Valerian fires back. Don't you worry. We have a plan, all right. No, yes, Tatters mutters. A stupid plan, executed to perfection. Hello and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your game master, and your guide as we follow our heroes on their journey into the unknown. For this game, I'll be using the Blades in the Dark rule set, as well as a variety of other systems, tools, and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer... Valerian and two other members of his crew, Alphonse Crater Crabtree and Tatiana Tatters Kaminoff, infiltrated Iron Hook Prison, disguised as a pair of bluecoats with their prisoner. Their goal? To spring Slate, the head of a rival crew of spies and thieves known as the Wraiths. Having found their target, all that remains now is to break him out of arguably the highest security compound in the entire city. Before we continue, let's rewind a little back to the last episode. At the start of the final scene of the previous chapter, I used another flashback scene to establish that the crew had got their hands on a map of the prison. Well, actually, that's not quite true. That was my intention, and so within the flashback, at the cost of one point of stress, I made a gather information roll and cited one of the NPCs listed on my crew sheet as the source of the information. I ended up with two dice. I rolled, and I got double sixes. Now, I mentioned before that a six in blades represents a success. What I didn't mention was that two or more sixes means a critical result. A yes and. You succeed, and it's better than you expected. So, in this case, I had received a map containing exceptional levels of detail. Not only the layout of the multi-level complex, but patrol routes and more. That's the narrative impact of the role. The mechanical impact is that the position improves. Position in Blades represents how dangerous or troublesome an action might be. The three possible positions are controlled, risky and desperate. The consequence of failure gets worse the more dangerous the position but there are also rewards. Any time a PC rolls a desperate action, they get to mark an experience point against that action's attribute. So the PCs have an incentive to push their luck and try dangerous things, and that's how they improve over time. I ruled that because of the exceptional map, Tatiana's next hunt roll would have a controlled position rather than the previous risky one, and that the map might provide future benefits as the fiction dictated. 
the next action roll was a success with a minor consequence. That meant two ticks in the fine slate clock, and that filled that clock, they'd found their target. But there was a consequence, and so I rolled on my oracle and got a new obstacle or threat appears. Well, nothing immediately sprang to mind, so I rolled on my picture oracle and got a cog and some bubbles. After a little bit of head-scratching, I decided that that probably meant some sort of water machine, maybe a water cannon, and that was at the end of the corridor. Valerian tried to bluff his way past but failed his sway roll, and the consequence he suffered was harm. That could have hurt him pretty badly, and so I attempted to resist the harm that he'd received, reducing it by one level. And luckily, in doing so, he suffered no additional stress. Next, Alphonse used one of his class abilities, which let him perform a feat of superhuman physical force at the cost of stress, and then he made a skirmish roll. The position had clearly degenerated at this point, and so I ruled things were back to desperate again for this action. But Alphonse pushed himself, gained extra dice at the cost of more stress, and ended up rolling a critical success. Instead of drawing out the fight at this point, I just ruled that he'd taken both guards down, and that they'd failed to hit the alarm. Next, Tatters made a tinker roll, which I flavoured as some sort of magical lockpick. With no immediate pressure on them, I ruled that the position here was back to controlled. Tatters succeeded, and the door opened. But there was a consequence, and this time the Oracle informed me that it was marking clock segments. Well, that filled up my alarm clock, and all of a sudden the prison was on a state of lockdown and high alert. Now, you may have noticed that unlike D&D, there's no rolling of initiative order in Blades. That's because the enemies don't actually take any actions, only the player characters do. Any failure or partial success that the PCs achieve determines what the enemies or the environment are doing. And so the enemies don't need to take their own turns, and the PCs can take their turns in whatever order makes the most narrative sense. In a group game, the GM would be sure to share the spotlight between the different players, but that's not necessary in a solo game. So one PC can hog the camera for a while if it makes sense. So in this case, Alphonse, for example, ran down the corridor, tore out a metal grill, and KO'd a bunch of guards. No counting of actions, or bonus actions, or move actions or anything, he just did a whole bunch of things that made sense to string together. If he'd hit a consequence, that may well have derailed him, and that might have been the opportunity to switch focus to the enemies, or another PC. This sort of fiction-first game design is a wonderful fit for the soloist. It can help make games feel much more cinematic than the more procedural, structured approach taken by D&D and similar games, which I'd argue has more of a focus on simulation than on narrative flow. Right, before I disappear down a game design rabbit hole, let's get back to our heroes, or anti-heroes, or shady criminal wrongs, whatever. On with the prison break. It's one more flight up, Tatter's pants winded after their long climb. Then we're at the security gate. Crater, I really hope you've got this next part covered. The big man just winks in response before opening a riveted steel door at the top of the stairwell and peering out. Sure enough, there's the security gate just across the corridor, a locked door of thick iron bars set into solid concrete. Even Alphonse won't be tearing through that. Fortunately, as planned, a solitary, anxious-looking prison guard stands on the far side of the gate, a large ring of keys clasped in his hands. Alphonse strides towards the man, who flinches back despite the protection of the bars. Kalinski, right? The wife and kids say hi. Alphonse grins, cracking his knuckles. That little one's a right handful, isn't he? The poor prison guard looks pale and sweaty. Uh, are they all right? Please don't hurt them. Alphonse grins. It's like I said, Kalinski. You do your job and there's no need for anyone to get hurt. And, as discussed... You'll come out of this with a tidy sum for your troubles. Now, open that gate. With the keys rattling in trembling hands, the guard fumbles at the lock. Alphonse leans in, his very physical presence a looming threat. Any time you're ready, son. 
The door swings open, and Alphonse towers over Kalinsky, who looks ready to faint. Good lad. Now, off your trot, eh? The guard doesn't need telling twice, and he sprints off down the corridor, not quite believing he's still alive. Seriously, Alphonse? Valerian looks uncharacteristically shocked. You threatened the man's children? When you asked me to put you in touch, I thought you just meant to bribe him. So what? It worked, right? Alphonse shrugged. You can't argue with results, ain't that what you always say? Though she looks no less enamoured at Crabtree's methods, Tatters interjects. Time to worry about questionable ethics later. And let's face it, it wouldn't be the first time. Right now we need to focus, and we're running out of time. The young arcanist is not wrong. Despite the still blaring alarm, things have gone remarkably smoothly so far. But now they are at the riskiest point in the plan. The hydraulic elevator, known as the Big Drop, is the single point of ingress and egress to the prison, a large, caged platform that climbs perhaps 200 yards straight up to the exterior of the building and the base of the hook, up on the vast flat roof that sits above the entire complex. And although the crew's extensive bribes and threats have left the path to their route out clear, they can hear the cries and clanging boots of approaching guards coming up the stairs. True enough, Tatters, true enough. Alphonse, lock that gate behind us. Everyone into the lift. You too, Slate. Tatters, get us out of here. The arcanist pulls at a large lever, and absolutely nothing happens. Oh, crap, she mutters. I was afraid of this. That doesn't sound like the plucky can-do spirit the web are so widely known for, Valerian says, smiling unconvincingly at Slate. What were you afraid of? When the alarm went off, it must have put the whole prison into full lockdown protocol. Tatters gazes round at the three faces staring dumbly back at her. Oh, they've cut the power. The damn lift won't work. Slate just rolls his eyes. Valerian, to his credit, recovers swiftly. Not to worry, a temporary setback, and one for which we have a perfectly serviceable contingency plan. Isn't that right, Tatters? Time for plan B. Valerian, you know the risks. I'm already short on juice, and if we hit topside without enough... Valerian brushes her concerns aside, as a horde of green-clad guards come pouring out of the stairwell across from them. They are spotted at once. One problem at a time, Tatters, my dear. Let's just get out of this particular mess first, all right? Tatters sighs, places her hands on the elevator's control box, and closes her eyes. Purple tendrils of light emerge from within her sleeves, penetrating the mechanism, spreading down the power cables and into the depths of whatever machinery powers this mechanism. A vibration underfoot indicates that power has been restored, though the lift remains firmly in place. Beads of sweat trickle down Tatter's forehead, her outstretched arms trembling with exertion. The guards are at the lift now, yelling orders and attempting to yank the door open. Only the Herculean strength of Alphonse, holding it closed, stands between the crew and immediate beating and capture. The guards hammer at the steel cage with their batons, attempting to crush the big man's fingers. No rush, Tatters, Valerian says, his voice conveying the exact opposite message. Any time you're ready. Through gritted teeth, Tatters hisses, I am ready, you cretin. Just take the damn break off. Hmm, no need to get snippy, Valerian replies, releasing a lever and doing his damnedest not to look like the idiot he feels. The platform immediately lurches upwards, dislodging several guards as it rises. Those that don't immediately let go only cling on for a few moments more, quickly realising they are not getting paid anything close to enough for death-defying or, more to the point, death-inducing heroics. The elevator emerges from the dingy interior of Ironhook Prison and out into the blindingly bright sunlight. The crew stumble out off the platform onto the centre of the vast flat prison roof and into the teeth of a bitingly chill wind. Above them, disconcertingly huge, the iron hook rises, and beyond that, the endless links of the great northern chain, receding into the distance. Directly above the hook hangs the link upon which Kairos sits, with its crisscrossing bridges and tangle of buildings, tiny at this great distance. Tatters stumbles, and only Alphonse's outstretched hand saves her from falling. She looks 
utterly drained, bathed in sweat, barely conscious. It's okay, Tatters. Rest a minute. You have time to take a breath. Just get your wind back. You've got this. As Valerian speaks, a dozen green dirigibles, marked with the iron hook insignia, rise into view on all sides, their rotary arcane cannons crackling with charge, and a magically amplified voice echoes across the expanse of the roof. Prisoners, lie face down on the ground, with your hands locked behind your heads. This is your first and final warning. Valerian kneels, taking Tatter's hands in his own. I'm sorry, Tatters. I take it back. No time. We need evac right now. I know you can do this. Tatters grimaces, her face pale and grey with exhaustion. You think? I can hardly stand, Valerian. This could kill me. All of you too, if I really screw it up. Alphonse puts a huge hand on her shoulder. I hate to admit it, but he's right, Tatters. If we don't get out of here, we're done. Us, the web, the wraiths. Shit, probably the whole damn city way things are going. You've got to do it. A voice from the gunship echoes out once more. Prime weapons, pick your targets. Oh, screw it. Tatters closes her eyes and takes a long breath out. The purple light swirls around her once more, brighter and more intense this time. It bleeds from her eyes, from her mouth and nostrils, growing in intensity brighter and brighter. Strange, disquieting shapes writhe within the light, buzzing with discordant power. Tatters looks up, teeth clenched, fixing her gaze at a point on one of the bridges overhead. Open fire! The amplified voice cries, and all around them the arcane weapons spin into life, their blasts slamming into the roof, a breaking crossfire drawing rapidly closer. Now! Valerian yells, still holding her hands tight. Tatters begins to scream, and there's a blinding flash. They're gone. Boy, that escalated quickly. Things started out well enough in that scene, with Tatters rolling a crit on her hunt roll to follow the map to a way out, and that meant that I could tick off three clock segments on breaking Slate out of prison. That meant there were only five left before he was free. At the same time, I kicked off a danger clock named Capture to represent the guard forces closing in. That seemed like a reasonable thing to do in light of the alert clock having been completed. I ruled the way out that they'd found was a locked security gate, which made sense in the fiction, and so that required the crew to figure out a way past it. For this, I used another flashback, for Alphonse this time, and made a risky command roll to see if threatening a prison guard's family would ensure that he opened the door at the right time. This was a very important roll, and so I loaded it up. One die from his command rating, one from pushing the roll at the cost of two stress, and another die from an assist from Valerian, which cost Valerian a stress. I figured the assist from Valerian was identifying the mark and setting up the meat in the first place, and that gave me a total of three dice. Now, when I rolled, the highest of those was a six, and that meant a clean success. Two more ticks on the clock to break Slate out, and, in the fiction, the guard folded like a cheap suit. Next, Tatters took an action to get the lift moving. We'd already established in the fiction that the alarm had resulted in lockdown, and so it made sense that she would need to magically tinker with the thing. I rated this as risky. She rolled a four and achieved a success, but with a consequence. Now, the good news here was that the success took them to seven out of eight segments marked off the escape clock. Pretty close. The bad news was that consequence. A roll on my oracle informed me that Tatters had to take stress. Now, this is probably an appropriate time to talk about the stress mechanic in Blades because it's a key way in which the escalation of tension and stakes kick in towards the end of a score, and also because it had a huge impact on the way that the second half of this scene played out. Stress in Blades is a sort of currency. You can spend it to improve your odds of success, adding a die to your dice pool by pushing yourself. You can use it to aid another, adding a die to their dice pool. And you can also use it to rework the narrative, introducing new truths into the fiction, in the form of flashbacks, as we've seen. As you may have noticed, my merry band have been cheerfully burning their way through stress to push, assist, and flashback on a pretty regular basis. There's just one problem with spending stress. 
you only have 9 points of it to spend. And if you use up all 9 points, you're out. Done for the scene, knocked out, catatonic, weeping uncontrollably, or whatever. Plus, it then means that you take a while to recover after the score. Plus, you take on a trauma. A trauma has a permanent effect on your character. You become cold, or reckless, or unstable, or whatever. There are eight of these trauma conditions in total. And here's the bad bit. They're permanent. They never get better. You are forever scarred by the stress that you've endured. Well, actually, did I say that was the bad bit? No, that, actually, there's worse. If you mark off four trauma conditions on your character, they're done. They're in prison for life, or they're broken, or they've gone to the dark side. They're no longer your PC. They are screwed. Anyhow, all this mattered because after all that stress spending along the way, that consequence that Tatters got meant she had to mark off her eighth and ninth stress point. She was down and of no further use to the party, and she was also going to have to mark a trauma. And that mattered, because my plan to escape this vast suspended prison absolutely involved Tatters teleporting the team off the roof and back to the city. And she couldn't very well do that as she was out of action for the remainder of the scene, now could she? I had one last desperate move up my sleeve. I could try to resist. I think I've mentioned resisting before. Basically, if you don't want to accept the consequence that you've received, you pick a suitable character attribute and then roll the corresponding number of dice. You subtract your highest result from six, and what's left is the amount of stress you take instead of the consequence. To understand what an attribute is, it's first worth explaining action ratings. Every character has a total of 12 action ratings, split evenly between the three attributes, which are Insight, Prowess and Resolve. For Insight, your action ratings are Hunt, Study, Survey and Tinker, for example. As character creation, you pick a suitable playbook for your scoundrel, and that gives you some starting action ratings. Playbooks can be thought of a little bit like character classes in D&D. They're not exactly the same, but close enough. And so, for example, Tatiana is a Whisper, who starts the game with two points in Attune and one point in Study. You then have four more points that you can spend as you wish. And so for Tatters, I put a point in Hunt, a point in Survey, a point in Tinker, and a point in Prowl. To calculate your attribute scores, you add up the number of action ratings with a rank against that attribute. So, as an example, Tatters has a point in Hunt, a point in Study, a point in Survey, and a point in Tinker, which are all Insight-related action ratings, and that gives her an Insight score of 4. The only rating she has marked against Resolve is Attune. She has two points in Attune, but you only add up the number of ratings with the rank, not the value of the rank itself, and so her Attune score is a lowly 1. By creating ranks in this way, the game encourages you to spread your ratings rather than focusing heavily into a single one if you want to get those attribute scores up high. In this case, the attribute that Tatters needed to roll against seemed pretty obvious. She was only going to pull off this feat of endurance through sheer grit and determination, and so resolve seemed like the clear choice. That meant she only had one dice, which meant that she was in a pretty dicey situation. She had a four in six chance of her resist roll dealing her enough stress to take her down anyway. In this case, I figured, what the hell? It couldn't do any more harm, and so I might as well just take the chance. And what do you know? I rolled a five. Tatters moved to eight stress instead of nine. She was still just barely hanging in there. I needed just one more tick in my breakout clock. This was it. It all came down to this final action roll. Tachana was attempting to use a tune to cast a teleportation ritual and the position here was obviously desperate. I reflected that in the fiction by adding this small fleet of gunships to join the party. Valerian assisted for an extra die, taking him to seven stress, and Tatters made something called a Devil's Bargain for another die. I figured that plus one heat was a suitable cost for that bargain. We'll cover both heat and Devil's Bargains at another time. So, I made the roll, and my best result? A five. A success, but with a consequence. The mission clock was complete. The team had made it. 
Slate was rescued and the first score was complete. But at what price? We'll find that out, along with how the crew's first downtime section plays out, next time on The Lone Adventurer. I hope you'll join me. You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, a solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider telling your friends about it or leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. It really is a huge help. You can find me on Twitter at TheLoneADV. You can email me at TheLoneADV at gmail.com or follow my blog at carlillustration.wordpress.com You can find show notes for this episode and all the others at theloneadventurer.podbean.com where I include any links mentioned in the episode as well as mechanics information. I also include a link to a full episode transcript. The story will continue in the next episode of The Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening.